The history of California lies like a map before me. Somewhat confused it may be, but I have seen it all. And if I had been a writer, which I am not, I could have written history. On April 4th of the year 1900, in the town of Chico, death claimed a truly remarkable Californian. Pioneer, soldier, farmer, founder, statesman, philanthropist. During his lifetime, John Bidwell had been all of these and an eyewitness to much of the state's eventful past. He lived in several worlds, a biographer recalled, in each of the great eras of California's history, the Hispanic regime, the period of American conquest, the vibrant days of 49, the building of the Golden State. In these, he participated actively and contributed richly, even to the final year of the 19th century. Who can be found to match such a record? Who, indeed? For six decades, the course of John Bidwell's life and the development of California were closely intertwined. This is a story of that association. Trapper's Tales and an adventurous spirit led John Bidwell west in 1841, a member of the first overland company of settlers bound for California. After a difficult five-month journey, the immigrants emerged from the Great Basin Desert only to face an even more imposing obstacle, the mile-high Sierra Mountain Wall. Journal, October 18th. A frightful prospect opened before us. Naked mountains whose summits still retained the snows, perhaps of a thousand years. The wind roared, but in the deep, dark gulfs which yawned on every side, profound solitude seemed to reign. Crossing the Sierra Crest, the party encountered a wild maze of ridges and canyons through which they wandered for more than a week. Finally, we had gone about three miles when, lo, to our great delight, we beheld a wide valley. Rivers evidently meandered through it, for timber was seen in long lines as far as the eye could reach. Saw many tracks of elk. Wild fowls were flying in multitudes, joyful sight to us poor famished wretches. I met many Indians, or rather several villages of Indians. They made no attempt to interfere with me. When the immigrants arrived in Central California, they found a landscape of almost unimaginable natural bounty, yet one which, within a generation, would largely disappear. John Bidwell's early writings provide us with a vivid picture of this pristine world in its twilight. I would like to give you an idea of the general character and features of this country. The great central feature, if I may use the term, is this grand valley of the Sacramento and San Joaquin. It is bounded on the east by the Sierra Nevada mountains, famous for their abundant snows. When the snows melt, the waters converge into mighty rivers, overflowing their banks, covering the plains like an inland sea. Tule marshes occupy large portions of the valley. These are the haunts of incalculable thousands of wild geese, ducks, cranes, pelicans, etc., etc. For miles you might travel in early spring, and beautiful flowers fairly paint the landscape in their rich profusion. Broad prairies covered with wild oats would be along your road. The valley was, apparently, still as new as when Columbus discovered America, and abounded in elk, deer, antelope, beaver, and otter. Grizzly bear were almost an hourly sight.
Just as the natural setting proved an endless source of wonder to an Easterner, so also did the cultural scene. The Alta California of those days was a remote, sparsely populated Mexican province that only 20 years earlier had won its independence from Spain. Bidwell found, The white population confined to a narrow belt along the coast, extending from Russian River to San Diego. There are no large towns. Monterey is the principal and contains about 500 inhabitants. Missions are nearly all broken up and those that remain are fast declining. One Spanish league, about six and a half square miles, is considered a farm. At this time, there was not in California any vehicle except a rude cart drawn by oxen. There was not, to my knowledge, a lawyer or law book, post office or mail route, printing office or newspaper, nor was there any military force to speak of. General Vallejo was commander-in-chief and lived at Sonoma. He kept there about 30 soldiers. Little inspiration was needed to feel that government so feebly equipped could not long endure. After obtaining a passport at Mission San Jose, Bidwell returned to the interior, having heard that a man named John Sutter was starting a colony there. Sutter treated everybody well, especially strangers. He gave me employment, first in charge of the Russian possessions on the seacoast, which he purchased, afterwards superintendent of his hop farm, and lastly, his bookkeeper and general business manager. Sutter's Fort became a primary destination for traders and immigrants. But as more Americans settled in Mexican California, the political situation grew increasingly tense. In 1846, tension escalated into conflict. Encouraged by Captain John C. Fremont, who had led an armed expedition from the States, a group of Americans seized control at Sonoma and declared California an independent republic. Bidwell took part, drafting what has been called the briefest constitution on record. The undersigned hereby agree to organize for the purpose of gaining and maintaining the independence of California. Before this so-called Bear Flag Revolt could run its course, word came that the U.S. government had declared war on Mexico. John Bidwell joined the army as a second lieutenant and came out with the rank of major. As for the resulting conquest of Alta California, the change came suddenly, and a welcome change it was. In the starry flag, all recognized the presence of the United States. Truth compels me to say, the war was not begun in California in defense of settlers. Americans wanted the country, they took it. Unknown to Bidwell at the time, far greater changes were coming. In January 1848, some flecks of gold caught the eye of a carpenter named James Marshall, who was building a sawmill for John Sutter in the Sierra foothills. Bidwell himself had written the contract to build that sawmill some months before. Sutter's wants for lumber increased year by year, and it became his custom to send men into the mountains to search for a place to build a sawmill. In 1846, he sent me. In 1847, he happened to send Marshall. The location Marshall chose was in a remote, steep-walled valley about 45 miles from Sutter's Fort. It was called Coloma. Marshall was a very curious fellow. It is hard to conceive how any sane man could have selected such a site for a sawmill. Surely no other man than Marshall ever entertained so wild a scheme as that of rafting sawed lumber down the canyons of the American River. And no other man than Sutter would have been so confiding and credulous as to patronize him. Yet the two together 
by this means turn the world upside down. Word of the gold discovery spread slowly at first. Bidwell personally carried the news to San Francisco in March. That autumn, reports were circulating in the East, and by 1849, the entire world knew. It was the beginning of a new epoch. From all states and countries, thousands rushed into California. Sacramento City was laid off on the river two miles west of the fort, and the town grew up there at once into a city. It became the bustling, buzzing center for merchants, traders, miners, etc., and every available room was in demand. Here were brought into contrast scenes of order, goodwill, and noblest friendship against anarchy, outrage, and crime. Like most, Bidwell felt the pangs of gold fever. He and another prospector were trying their luck along the Feather River when... We came to a place which is now about six miles from Oroville. We struck a pick into the shelving rock near the water's edge and found it all brilliant with gold. It was almost pure. I had brought five or six Indians with me. They soon learned that there was value in the gold and gave up cheerfully all they had for sugar. I found what was called Bidwell's Bar and mined two seasons on the Feather River. When gold was discovered, everything else was neglected. Not quite everything, actually. Because of California's fabulous wealth and sudden recognition, the matter of statehood took on a new urgency. Once again, John Bidwell became involved. In 1849, I was elected to the convention which framed our state constitution, but circumstances prevented me from attending. In the same year, I was elected to the state senate. In 1850, I was commissioned to convey to the national capital a block of gold-bearing quartz to represent California in the Washington Monument. While in Washington, D.C., Bidwell lobbied energetically for California's admission to the Union. Returning, he was able to announce that statehood was an accomplished fact. Like the events so rapidly unfolding in California, John Bidwell's life was also to take a new important turn. Deeply interested in farming, he used his mining profits to purchase a large fertile tract of land he had long admired. Rancho del Arroyo Chico, it was called, and it encompassed more than 20,000 acres of Butte County. Always a pioneer, Bidwell now devoted himself to exploring the productivity of soil. Farming necessarily followed mining, because the mining created a demand for farm products. We immediately began raising more and more wheat, more cattle and horses, I furnished flour to the mines and the valley generally. Diversity was the hallmark of Bidwell's operation, and soon he was producing an amazing variety of grains, row crops, fruits, nuts, and ornamental plants. Some species, the cassava melon among them, were first grown in California at Rancho Chico. The ranch became a model of modern farming, with its produce routinely winning top honor at competitions. Bidwell became a leading member of the State Agricultural Society, and at its annual meetings, he freely shared his interests and ideas. Even now, in the morning of her agriculture, California has demonstrated her capacity for varied and almost boundless production. All that California needs is intelligent labor to make it what it should be, the most delightful abode of man on earth. Much of the farmer's burden, Bidwell realized, could be lightened through technology. Wheat, fast becoming California's most important crop, provided a case in point. When we began, all our grain was cut with sickles by hand. 
It was not long before we had cradles and reapers and other farming implements. Until now, I think we have the most improved and efficient harvesting machinery in the world. Still, there were other, larger challenges to face. As a farmer, Bidwell keenly felt the effects of California's peculiar climate. During the summer, months would pass without a drop of rain. Then in winter, storm might fall a storm, flooding towns and farms throughout the Central Valley. But Bidwell was confident these problems could be solved. I believe the floods can be prevented by building reservoirs to retain the waters in the mountains and by raising levees along the rivers. Channels must be cut to conduct the waters to drier lands. Streams can be made available for irrigation. I look upon the future of agriculture in California to depend largely on irrigation. You can substitute irrigation for showers and literally purple a landscape with ripening fruits. Only one thing more was required for California's agriculture to achieve its full potential, a broader market. And in this, also, Bidwell's vision of the future would prove accurate. It is essential for us to improve all possible ways of transportation. This once out-of-the-way land of ours is soon to become one network of rails, wires, and locomotives. And as these checker the continent, so are steam and sail to streak the ocean. Multitudes have come and are coming to swell our population. Progress seems stamped upon the very face of things. It is the life and spirit of the age. A tireless advocate of California's natural resources, John Bidwell saw great potential in the state's human resources as well. In 1860, he founded the town of Chico adjacent to his ranch, offering a free lot to anyone willing to build there. Later, he subdivided additional land to accommodate the area's growth. My dear Annie, Chico bids fair to become a fine town. The country is improving and has, we think, a grand future. Society will be just what we shall make it. While serving in Congress, John Bidwell met Annie Ellicott Kennedy. The two were married in 1868, and they dedicated themselves to a life based on progressive ideas and lofty ideals. Of special concern to them both was the welfare of the Machupta Indians, the original inhabitants of the region. There was not anything on Rancho Chico so dear to my husband as this little band of about 250 Indians, and they were the first object of interest to which he lovingly called my attention the morning after my arrival. He had moved the entire village into his private grounds near our residence in order to protect them. Though their actions might seem patronizing by today's standards, the Bidwells offered the Machuptas sanctuary employment, and a formal education at a time when much of California's Indian culture was either being disrupted or destroyed. I have never justified any abuse or wrong treatment of the Indian. I had for them a regard, a sympathy, knowing that their lands had been taken from them without any compensation. The Bidwell's social conscience also drew them to other causes. John carried their beliefs into the political arena, where he campaigned for election reform, control of monopolies, women's suffrage, and temperance. More than once, his unwillingness to compromise on matters of principle limited his success. I was defeated for governor, defeated by money, fraud, and trickery defeated because I would not stoop to corruption. But I have kept my purpose. Characteristically, Bidwell was ahead of his time, raising issues that would reform and reshape state politics after the turn of the century. 
John and Annie had no children of their own, but in a sense, the townspeople of Chico became their extended family and the recipients of their kindness. Over the years, the Bidwells freely gave of their time, funds, and property for community improvement. Part of the land on which Chico State University now stands was just one of many Bidwell gifts. But by far the most substantial present was the 2,200 acres of Rancho Chico, now known as Bidwell Park. One of the largest and loveliest municipal parks in the nation, it affords a wide range of recreational opportunities, including a chance to glimpse California much as John Bidwell saw it 150 years ago. After John's death, Annie deeded the parkland to the city of Chico for public use, in accordance with his wishes. As much as you love the canyon and the creek, the bonny birds, wild flowers and ferns, you can never appreciate them or love them as we have. This park is a precious gift. I have put it out of my power to sell it, should age weaken my sense of its sacredness or the blessing it may be for all time. Annie Bidwell outlived her husband by 18 years. Together, their lives in California spanned three quarters of a century, during which they not only witnessed the map of history unfolding, but boldly left their mark upon it. It's still possible to retrace John Bidwell's path through California history. The Russian outpost of Fort Ross, Sutter's Fort, Sonoma Barracks, Marshall's Sawmill at Coloma, Old Sacramento, each has been restored to recapture some essence of the past. Today, the Bidwell's home is preserved and protected as a state historic park, and their name, memorialized in many ways, still echoes through the Central Valley. And yet, the true Bidwell legacy extends well beyond place names and parks. By giving themselves to good works and high ideals, John and Annie Bidwell gave themselves to us, to the people of Chico, past and present, and to Californians as a whole. If there is a spot on earth where I prefer to live, it is California. And for one, all my hopes, all my endeavors, every thought and purpose of my mind are united with the interests of California.